சார் குட் மார்னிங் சார் எஸ் சார் எஸ் சார் இஸ் வெரி இஸ் வெரி கிளியர் சார் Shall we start, sir? Yes, we are all ready. So, I'll begin, sir. Yeah, Professor Raghul, sir, shall we start? Definitely, definitely. Thank you, sir. Uh, Please go uh, ahead. Professor Dhamani, sir, shall we continue, sir? Sir, your audio is not audible, sir. sir no. no no sir no sir you are not audible no okay sir ah yes sir yes sir now 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 okay thank you uh, okay. sir my head of the department and principal madam say that uh, you will have to let them in so both of them my principal and head of the department are waiting outside yes madam uh, name please madam uh, dr t palaneshwari principal palaneshwari uh, uh, in what name they are here madam sir i have entered sir dr t palaneshwari i have entered sir okay so, madam has entered okay so and your head chodi madam uh, dr k muttamil selvi okay 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 madam madam if you want to allow if you want uh, uh, anyone to enter into this you can contact uh, uh, bodhi office madam they will uh, accept okay no, no, we are getting into this okay and the madam yes sir yes good morning a very warm and hearty welcome to bodhi international congress an international online conference on paradigm shifts in teaching language literature and culture organized by the research department of english the american college madurai and bodhi international journal in association with university of jammu jammu and kashmir uh, department of english women's christian college nagakoil and standard fireworks rajaratnam college shivagasi this conference has brought together organizers from kashmir to kanyakumari from different dimensions of teaching language and literature This pandemic era has brought in a lot of changes in the lifestyles of human- humanity especially locking us up in our own houses but platforms like these have enabled us to connect and interact with people from from various cultures and background which is one of the uniqueness of this conference this conference aims at providing a forum to introduce and edify everyone to the different practices of teaching language and literature and culture through connecting eminent speakers and enthusiastic participants from around the globe from different walks of life this conference aims at creating a platform to share one's knowledge and vast experience i once again welcome you all for this grand conference before we begin this conference prayer is a way of expression our thanks to god and acknowledge god for every beautiful beginning of the day I kindly request everyone to observe 2 minutes of silence prayer.
Thank you. Uh, today's session will be will begin with an inauguration, well, which begins with welcome address, concept note, presidential address, patron uh, patrons address, felicitation, and vote of thanks. To begin this inauguration, I request Dr. Rajesh Kumar, head and assistant professor of English, University of Jammu, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you so much, madam, for the opportunity. Professor Rahul Gupta, Rector of Bhadrava Campus, University of Jammu, and the Chief Patron of the Conference, Dr. M. Devamani Christopher, Principal and Secretary, the American College, Madurai, and the Patron of the Conference, Dr. C. M. Padma, Principal, Women's Christian College, Kanyagumari, and the Chairperson of the Conference, Dr. T. Palneshwari, Principal, the Standard Fireworks, Rajaratnam College for Women, Sivakasi, and the Chairperson of the Conference, Dr. J. John Saker, Head and Associate Professor, Department of English, the American College, Madurai and the Convener of the Conference. Dr. J. Subita Persis, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of English, Women's Christian College, Kanyakumari, and the Convener of the Conference. Dr. Mani Mangai Mani from University Putra, Malaysia. Dr. Mahendran Manim from Sultan Idris Education University, Malaysia. Dr. Isaya Brito Rafael from Al Jazan University, Saudi Arabia. Dr. S. Balakrishnan, founder director of CRRPS, publisher, come editor of Roots and Bodhi Journals, and the organizing secretary of the conference. Distinguished guests, sessions, chairpersons, dear colleagues, participants, paper presenters from India and overseas, supporting staff, scholars, ladies, and gentlemen. I, Dr. Rakesh Kumar, deem it to be a matter of great privilege and honor to present a formal vote of welcome address in the inaugural session of such an international mega academic event being organized by Research Department of English, the American College, Bodhi International Journal in association with the Department of English, Badrava Campus, University of Jammu Department of English, Women's Christian College, and the Research Department of English, the Standard Fireworks Rajaratnam College for Women. On behalf of the conference team and on my own behalf, first of all, I take this opportunity to welcome Professor Rahul Gupta, Honorable Rector Badrava Campus, University of Jammu, and the Chief Patron of the conference for being there, for encouraging all such academic events, and for taking out time from his busy schedule to be with us in this inaugural session. A hearty welcome, sir. I formally welcome Dr. Davamani Christopher, Principal and Secretary of the American College, Madurai, and the patron of this conference. Sir, your gracious presence is very encouraging and we are really delighted to have you in this inaugural session. Welcome, sir. I also welcome Dr. C. M. Padma. I also welcome Dr. C. M. Padma, Principal Women's Christian College, Kanya Kumare, and Chairperson of the conference. Welcome, madam. We warmly welcome Dr. T. Palneswari, Principal, the Standard Fireworks, Rajaratnam College for Women, Sivakasi, and the Chairperson of the conference. Welcome, Madam. I am extremely happy to have this opportunity to welcome Dr. J. John Saker, Head and Associate Professor, Department of English, the American College, Mudrai, and the Convener of the conference. Sir, I don't know. You remember me, but I can't forget the academic luminary like you are. I am thankful to my stars for getting the opportunity to meet you in Malaysia last year during Bodhi International Conference. I'm quite excited to listen to your concept note today and meet the scholar in you once more. Welcome, sir. I'm, I also welcome Dr. J. Subita Persis, Assistant Professor and Head of the Department of English. Women's Christian College, Kanyakumari, and the convener of the conference. Welcome, madam. 
Our welcome is also due to Dr. S. Balakrishnan, founder, director of CRRPS, publisher, come editor of Roots and Bodhi Journals, and the organizing secretary of the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, he is actually the main pillar of this conference. Welcome, Dr. Balakrishnan. Let me also take this opportunity to welcome session chairpersons, dear colleagues, participants, paper presenters, scholars from India and overseas to this three day international conference and we hope that the conference will successfully offer the audio visual intellectual treat for these conference days and all stakeholders would not only be benefited by the academic dialogue but also with academic networks built for future academic events welcome one and all stay safe stay healthy and keep the academics on and thumbs up to all the participants over to you ma'am thank you so much Thank you, sir, for a warm welcome. I now request Dr. Uh, Jaswin Jerish, Assistant Professor of English, Christ Academy Univers Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore, to deliver the concept note. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. A very pleasant uh, good morning to all the scholarly audience present here. Uh, I thank all the organizers, the heads of the institutions, of the institutions which organize this international conference for the opportunity given to me to uh, deliver the concept note on this uh, reputed international conference. As the uh, speaker during the welcome speech uh, was talking about the person who was intended to make this concept note, I really feel it's a uh, it's indeed a big shoes to fill at this point in time to uh, deliver the concept note in the place of Dr. J. John Saker. But then uh, I would like to introduce this uh, conference, the theme, the paradigm shifts in teaching language, literature and culture, which is very pertinent at this point in time when education in itself as a whole is looking towards a change. And I appreciate uh, the American College Bodhi International Journal, University of Jammu, Women's Christian College, Narquil, the Standard Fireworks, Rajaratnam College for Women uh, for uh, choosing this topic, uh, which is something uh, which is close to the scholarly audience of this uh, international conference and also in general, to look forward as teachers, as researchers and scholars uh, to adapt to the change which is uh, happening around us. Education in line for an online future is the call which is found around us and we have to change, adapt ourselves to the change. The three dimensions of English studies, language, literature, and uh, cultural studies uh, has always been uh, contested as academic disciplines, uh, how it is taught, it is how it is tested, uh, it is assessed, and how the students uh, progress uh, in the process is something which has always been contested and it has been the key point of all deliberations in international conferences, workshops, webinars, seminars throughout uh, the past, uh, the turn of the new millennium. And uh, even in the webinars for the past six months during the uh, pandemic lockdown, we have been used to uh, such topics, yet, yet we find as teachers, of English language, literature, and cultural studies, we find it uh, quite complex to make it more academic than many other, like many other disciplines of science uh, and other, uh, other disciplines from arts and humanities. So at this point in time, language needs a revisiting in terms of teaching language as skills rather than a subject in many contexts whether it is general English or teaching language uh, for in specific purposes, we need to look into the ways in which it can be taught as skills. And especially the more important aspect in my opinion is learning oriented assessment, how to test learning, how to test the progress uh, of the student in terms of uh, uh, testing, because in, more, uh, in most uh, cases, testing and teaching is isolated. We teach and we test something else and testing in most cases will not reflect the learning which happens in the students. So that is an important aspect of which needs to change and which is changing testing in the modern sense, especially in the uh, pandemic period, we have been testing using the online platform where the conventional idea of invigilating and all that is removed to an extent. 
we need to think of testing which is more critical creative so that the students can uh, enhance higher order thinking skills in the process literature uh, when it comes to literature i would like to mention that we are in the age of watching uh, the recent uh, dell ad uh, uh, makes a slogan this kind of this kind which says no watching is the new everything watching is the new everything and at this point in time expecting our digital natives to read uh, is something which is really difficult and we find most of our students and even scholars find it difficult to spend quality time on reading at this point in time to re revitalize reading to make students read how to change our pedagogy to ensure reading again testing becomes an important uh, uh, issue of discussion here because we know that in our context even without reading literary texts one can complete even a ug pg or even a phd degree and uh, when it comes to the ugc exams also uh, students can even uh, complete the tests by reading the summary but that leads to what uh, clint brooks talks about heresy of paraphrase paraphrase reading a paraphrased material is not reading the text as it is so we have to look into ways in which we can test so that students can uh, students are uh, forced to read the text so at the uh, time where students prefer more watching a uh, recent american study says the average screen time has gone up and the page time has gone down the teenagers of today are called screen agers uh, they spend more time on screen how to make reading uh, digitally relevant to the students of today is something which we have to discuss and contemplate culture again at the crossroads of online future in terms of education in the world where there is more uh, hatred discrimination bigotry Uh, when students tend to learn in the online platform how to take them to a real life situation where they can learn life skills social skills how they can learn differences in communities cultures is something which is really important so at the at the basis uh, from the basis of looking at from the perspective of online education in the future which is going to be the norm in the future at least in a blended way both offline and online coming together as even uh, ugc in india is also talking about contemplating about i find it is really uh, important it is really pertinent to talk about the changes the paradigm shifts in uh, uh, teaching language literature and also culture so i strongly believe that the uh, international conference for the next 3 days would uh, discuss uh, on these issues and the discourses will be really effective for research scholars uh, teachers and students uh, who are looking forward to reinvent themselves to revisit to refocus in the journey of teaching and the journey of teaching and learning process so to conclude i would like to make a, a quote uh, to quote uh, john dewey a famous educationalist of the 20th century one of my favorite quotes um, it goes like this i quote if we teach today's students as we taught yesterday's we rob them of a beautiful tomorrow if we teach today's students as we taught yesterday's we rob them of a tomorrow john dewey says this i unquote so this Uh, makes gives us a clear perspective of how we have to change in the way in which we teach how we have to rethink the way in which we teach and uh, conceptualize teaching and learning if we teach of how we did yesterday we are robbing them robbing the students from a beautiful tomorrow by this note i conclude and i also wish the organizers the participants uh, the chairpersons of technical sessions the plenary speakers uh, to take us through uh, throughout the journey of teaching and learning i wish the organizers a grand success thank you thank you sir uh, i also make uh, take this opportunity to welcome uh, the speakers dr mani mani mangai mani and dr mahendran welcome welcome sir welcome ma'am hello good morning good morning ma'am Thank you thank you madam i'm here all the best yes
Uh, I now request uh, Dr. Devamani Christopher, Principal and Secretary, the American College Madurai, to deliver the presidential address. Over to you, sir. Good morning. International online conference organized by the Research Department of English, the American College, in collaboration with the University of Jammu from today to 1st November. Respected Professor Raghul Gupta, Rector of Badirwa campus of the University Jammu, who is going to deliver the inaugural address. Dr. Prakash Kumar, Head of the Department of English, Badirwa campus of the University of Jammu, who welcomed the gathering. Dr. John Shager, the eminent professor from the American College and also the Dean of American College and Head of the Research Department of English. Dr. Jirish, the alumnus and assistant professor of English in Christ Academy, who briefly explained the concept note of the conference. Dr. Batma, principal of Women's Christian College, Norway. Dr. Palaniswari, principal of SFR College for Women's Vagasi. Both are going to offer the felicitations. Dr. Subhita Persis, who is to propose a vote of thanks. Participants, delegates, and student friends. A pleasant morning to all of you. It gives me immense pleasure to offer a presidential address on the occasion of three-day international online conference on paradigm shifts in teaching language, literature, and culture from today to 1st November. It is a laudable venture on the part of Bodhi International Congress to bring the 140 years old American colleagues the University of Jammu from the extreme north and WCC from the extreme south and SFR College from Sivagasi to the same platform using technology during this pandemic period. Congratulations to Dr. Balakshnan. I know Dr. Balakshnan for the past many years. Not only Bodhi. Dr. Balakrishnan is also the publisher of Roots, uh, another international journal. He is a smart, he is a smart and hard worker in his academic activities. We had so many conferences with the support of Dr. Balakrishnan through Roots and Bodhi. One we had it in Singapore in the year 2007-17. There are more than 120 participants, it was a grand success. Likewise, during this pandemic period, Dr. Balakrishnan is organizing a wonderful program. Pedagogy is important as far as territory level education is concerned. School teachers are lucky enough to have free service training to become teachers. In case of college and university teachers, there is no pedagogical requirements. They simply follow their teachers. But students keep changing with the changing time. Hence, our teaching and testing styles must suit learners' learning style. Each English teachers serve the entire student community. Hence, they should have a different approach to teaching English language from teaching literature. The English teachers are serving department and servicing department. My humble suggestion to all of you is teach until the students understand or until the students learn. Teaching is not to satisfy oneself, but should satisfy students. So we must teach until the students are satisfied. Otherwise, there is no use of teaching a child. As Dr. Jiris pointed, I hope this three-day international conference would deliberate how to teach language, literature, 
and culture in order to suit the 21st century learners. I wish the conference all success. God bless. Thank you, sir. Uh, I now request Professor Rahul Gupta, Rector, University of Jammu, to deliver the patron's address. Thank you, Dr. Anita. Uh, good morning to all the delegates. And uh, it gives me immense pleasure to be part of the inaugural function of the three-day online Bodhi International Congress on theme, Paradigm Shifts in Teaching, Learning, Literature, and Culture. First of all, I should compliment Dr. Rakesh Kumar because I have recently joined as Rector Bhadrava Campus and uh, he was on to holding this conference in association with other, other uh, bodies from last, uh, I think, uh, one year uh, since his visit to Malaysia. And uh, now at last we have, we have been successful to co-host this uh, online conference. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Rakesh to take, to, for, taken, for, for taking this initiative. And uh, now uh, the curtain raiser is there for this conference and I hope the deliberations for the next three days would be quite beneficial. I also compliment Dr. Johnson Jinesh for giving me the concept note. And uh, we have been, we have got a lot of information regarding this conference. And uh, I am also thankful to Dr. M. Dawapani Christopher for his presidential address, which was quite informative. Uh, apart from that, all the organizers, including Dr. J. John Seker, Dr. C. M. Padma, Dr. T. Pal Pal Palneshwari, uh, Dr. J. Subita Persis, and all other members of the organizing committee of being, being cooperative and uh, in uh, making this event a success. And uh, my only uh, observation and re remark for this inaugural is that, uh, like other uh, researches, this research, the deliberations, which whatever we have, we will have in the next three days, I think uh, ultimately we should have uh, analysis of the outcome of this Congress, which is very important. We should see what is the impact of this conference because uh, uh, online conferences are uh, not, not, the, uh, not the normal uh, normal thing in, in, in this COVID situation. But uh, uh, important is that whatever the deliberations are there, what is the output, what is the outcome? That is very important because unless you don't have an outcome, uh, a good outcome, there is no fun of holding these conferences. So I am really thankful to uh, uh, the organizers, uh, research department of English, the American College Madurai, the Bodhi International Journal for uh, collaborating with department of English Madura campus and Women's Christian College, uh, Nagar Kohli Tamil Nadu and the standard fireworks Sivakasi for making this event successful. And uh, I hope that the deliberations would be very useful. And let's see after three days, what is the outcome, which is very important. And uh, uh, plus I would also like to request the organizers that uh, since uh, uh, th and this kind of conference is never held in Jammu, G and K. So I request that for future, they may plan with the help of Dr. Rakesh Kumar would be there that they should hold it, hold this conference uh, when the uh, post COVID nat naturally uh, offline. And we would like to see all of the participants in Bhadrava, which is small, which is known as small Kashmir. So I welcome you and uh, request you to hold this conference uh, sometimes after post COVID situation in the offline mode in Bhadrava also. For that, I would be very thankful to you and uh, my best wishes for this conference. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I now request uh, Dr. T. Parnishwari, Standard Fireworks, Rajaratnam College of Women, Sivagasi, to go ahead with the felicitation. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Distinguished dignitaries on the virtual days, organizing committee members of this three-day Bodhi International Congress and International Conference, 
faculty and student participants from different parts of our country and abroad a pleasant morning to one and all i am very much delighted to be one among the dignitaries in the inaugural session of this conference we are all experiencing an unprecedented situation emerging out of covid-19 pandemic which has severely changed our life but technology has penetrated into virtually all areas of operations this virtual world has replaced most of our real life connections not only shopping nowadays education is on so happening online with the advent of knowledge and a revolution in technology there has been a drastic change in teaching the core practices of a given discipline this paradigm shift in education makes us to think and act in new ways there has been a radical change in the teaching methodologies we the teachers are being shifted from brick and mortar teaching to online teaching that is from traditional teaching to modern teaching change is inevitable once we accept and adapt to change it would be quite an easy and enjoyable transition the international conference adopts a timely theme technology has intertwined with the teaching practices we the teaching professionals must identify the effective ways of transformations in teaching hope this three day conference would be more effect informative interactive and productive i would like to congratulate and thank every member of the organizing committee for the painstaking efforts in organizing this virtual international conference which is the need of the hour i wish this conference a grand success thank you onanda thank you ma'am i now request dr j uh, subita prasi assistant professor and head department of english women's christian college nagarkoil to deliver the vote of thanks thank you a very warm good morning to you all the essence of all beautiful art is gratitude i deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion let me first of all start by giving glory to the almighty god for making today's event a success an event like this cannot happen overnight the wheels started rolling months ago it required planning and a bird's eye for details we are being fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated academicians First of all I'd like to thank our correspondent Dr R C Parke Singh and our principal Dr C M Padma for motivating and encouraging us to be a part in organizing this 3 day international conference on paradigm shifts in teaching language literature and culture Then I thank the chief patrons of this conference Professor Manoj Kedar Vice Chancellor University of Jammu Kashmir Professor Rahul Gupta Rector Badewa Campus Jammu Kashmir and Dr M Daumani Christopher Principal and Secretary the American College Madurai for the valuable contribution towards this conference I also thank Professor Rakesh Kumar from Badewa campus Jammu Kashmir who gave the welcome address then i thank dr jehoshin jiresh who gave the concept note for this conference and gave a good start i also thank dr yam daumani christopher principal and secretary the american college madurai who gave the presidential address then my special thanks to the chairs persons of this conference Dr C M Padma and Dr Principal of Women's Christian College Nagarkoil and Dr T Palaneshwari Principal SFR College for Women Sivakasi 
I would like to thank, take this opportunity to place on record my gratitude to the advisors of this conference. Then I express my sincere thanks to the conveners and the organizing secretaries and academic conveners of various colleges for all their untiring efforts towards the functioning of the conference. I thank all the coordinators for their involvement and their willingness to take tasks and complete them in the stipulated time. My vote of thanks will be incomplete if I leave out Dr. Balakrishnan, who works behind the screen for the success of this conference. Finally, I thank all the participants for their enthusiastic participation. I end by giving an inspiring quote by Martin Luther King. An individual has not started living until he rises above the confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. Once again, I think thank each and everyone who contributed in one way or other to the success of this three-day international conference. Thank you one and all. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we will just go into the next proceeding of the conference, which is the keynote address, which will be followed by the plenary talks. And after post lunch, we will have the paper presentation. On day two, uh, the day will start at 10 a.m. with a plenary talk and panel discussion at 11 a.m. and paper presentation at 12, 2 p.m. post-lunch. On the third day, November 1st, we will have the paper presentation at 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. and followed by a valedictory function at 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Thank you. Moving on to the next session of the day, the keynote address. The resource person of this session is Dr. Mani Mangai Mani, uh, Senior Lecturer, Department of English, University, Putra, Malaysia, Malaysia. A warm welcome to you, ma'am. And, and this session will be cha uh, chaired by Dr. K. Muttamal Sevi, Head and Associate Professor English. The Standard Fireworks Raj, Raj, Rajaratnam College for Women, Sivagasi. Over to you, ma'am. A happy morning to everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mani Mangai Mani to, to be the resource person of this wonderful occasion. We are happy to meet you in this virtual occasion, ma'am. I welcome you once again. And we are ready to adapt to the Thank changes. Thank you, likewise. Uh, we are ready to adapt <laughs> to the changes. And we are interested to impart the required skills for the students using modern technology. And I think the students are also interested to learn a lot from us teachers. 
and we are ready to listen to your valuable advice to how to switch over to modern technology and impart higher order thinking into the minds of the students welcome you ma'am once again thank you a uh, very good morning to the organizers um i would like to share the screen can you please enable the screen sharing um uh can you see the screen madam yes ma'am the screen is visible uh madam chairperson can you see the screen yes ma'am uh your presentation has started ma'am we are able to see okay it. so shall i begin yes ma'am i sure, hope ma i'm audible thank yes, you thank you okay thank you for your response all right good morning to all of you over there The theme of this online conference is paradigm shifts in teaching language, literature, and culture. This involves the fundamental shifts, changes, or approaches in teaching these three fields. From blackboard and chalk pieces, the teaching of language, literature, and culture certainly has made a big leap. these shifts are essential around us for india the diminishing of sanskrit one of the oldest language in the world is a classic reminder of the fact that everything that is unable or fluctuate evolve in accordance to the development of mankind from the state of a scholarly and a dominant language in this subcontinent sanskrit is now confined to religious and philosophical texts due to the lack of vocabulary to cope with the present development like came extinct due to its inability to move along with the flow of time this is because one single dominating factor that determines culture tradition language and to some extent even religion is its ability to evolve and adapt itself according to the needs and the changes of time therefore to keep abreast with the changes that is taking place in the world a paradigm shift is certainly necessary look at it to scholars students digitalized one no longer need to hold a sorry i think there was some technical glitch there okay as i was telling earlier talking earlier one no longer need to have a book to read okay you can download a book using your computer or your handphone teachers have become innovative yeah teachers have become innovative and we no longer use the blackboard or chalk anymore with the availability of technology the teaching has certainly taken a new form what more now at the present condition and situation with the covid-19 pandemic if we did not succumb into the changes we will not be having this online conference higher institutions are surviving the pandemic through online teaching methods 
Yeah, like it or not, the pandemic has brought inevitable paradigm shift in the teaching of language, literature, and culture at present. Looking into teaching literature, there is certainly lots of changes. The teaching of literature changed because of the changes that took place in the works of literature produced by the writers. Teaching literature also involves writing literature. Shifting in paradigm also involves the changes or a fundamental shift we see in the contemporary works of writers today. What kind of literature do these writers want to present to their readers? That is the important question here. I am not going to talk on how teaching literature has been improvised, but how literature itself has taken a paradigm shift, which forced the teaching of literature to take a shift. At one time, the colonized countries were using language of the colonizer as a medium of education. After independence, the language remained in these once colonized countries as the second language, including India. Literature taught to the subjects were British literature, whereby students were exposed to the works of Shakespeare and so on. However, after some time, the colonized people started to produce or write their own literature using English language as the medium of their works. For today, paradigm shifts in the works of contemporary Indian writers, whereby we, we as teachers in teaching this kind of literature has a rich history of literature in English. The English language was introduced as the medium of instruction in 1835 through the Macaulay's Minute. The Macaulay's Minute promoted English literature and did not favor the use of mother tongue in India. The first Indian English novel was written by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, who wrote The Rajmohan's Wife was not only Chatter Chatterjee's debut novel, but it also signifies the beginning of the Indian English novels. In the beginning of the, of the 19th century, there was a gradual increase in the number of Indian English novelists with writers like Romesh Chandra Dutt, whose books were translated into English T. Ramakrishna Tagore, who was honored with the um, T. Ramakrishna, Swarna Goshal, and Sir Joginder Singh. Now, after that period, uh, we must remember that one was the undeniably talented writer who was also considered as a poet, playwright, and painter was Rabindranath Tagore, who was honored with the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1912 for Gitanjali. And, and in the 20th century, there were writers like Mulkraj Anand, R.K. Narayan, and Raja Rao. In the 1950s, too, there were uh, there were rising of some prominent uh, Indian English writers such as Anita Desai, Arun Joshi, and Kushman Singh. Later on, there were writers like Salman Rushdie, Amitav Ghosh, Arundhati Roy, Shashi Tharoor, and many more. Now, many of these writers have written novels on politics. Yeah, they have written novels on politics, social history, and even religion and mythology. 
and most of their themes were on the conflicts faced by man mankind, social phenomenon, and relationships. Sorry, the reception is quite bad here, I think. Okay. Um, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Uh, now we are audible. audible. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, ma'am. It's shared with us. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thus, Themes evolving around the conflict of man with his surroundings and his inner self, social phenomenon, family relationships, cr uh, crisis, which dominated the world of literature for centuries, seems to have taken the back seat and fallen out of favor among the contemporary Western writers. So it is not surprising to see novels produced in the Western world nowadays lingering around science and technology. For example, Kingdom and United States especially are very much interested in of technological changes in human and his life and is full of imaginative and futuristic concepts and ideas. One of the most significant aspects of science fiction is human transformation. The Western writer's interest is writing on future times where human beings live in virtual and such as cyborgs, superhuman, humanoids, androids, and artificial intelligent robots. Some of the most noteworthy science fiction novels by American uh, science fiction writers are like Vitals, uh, uh, Quantico, and War Dogs by Greg Bear. And another notable science fiction writer from America is Joe Haldeman, who wrote Forever Peace, uh, Forever War, and The Tool of Trade. However, when we look into the Indian fictions today, there seems to be a distinct, different path, a difference in the path taken by the present Western and Eastern writers. While the Western writers are venturing into the future, the world of cyborgs and humanoids, the contemporary writers from India have come up with a different and rather contradicting trend in their making of fictions. This is the paradigm shift that I have noticed among the Indian contemporary writers. So when the Indian contemporary writers take a paradigm shift in the works produced by them, so automatically, the teaching of literature to need to take a paradigm shift. Now, these writers seem to be very comfortable in reminiscing the past, the historical episodes and rewriting them as novels. We will see how some of the contemporary writers in India have switched to this trend of writing. Although many of these writers still prefer to harp on the traditional themes such as social phenomenon, politics, inner conflict of the characters, religion, and so forth. But then there is definitely a clear and a notable new tendency that can be seen in some of the recent works. There are a group of contemporary writers who actually love to rewrite old epics in the form of fictions, a trend which is definitely alien in the writing of fiction in, in the Western world. In, in a clear break away from the normal modern fiction writings, these writers utilize the contents of well traditional literature or history, and by using the, their creativity and the imagination, create a story inside the story. They normally pick on a particular character or a secluded episode from the selected epics of history and create an astonishing plot and a storyline which are highlighted or deemed important in the original text. By doing so, they provide another form of literature to the younger generations by giving life and glorifying the past 
or revealing a subtle message that is not seen at the surface of the original story. In short, readers are given an opportunity to peek into their country's glorious past through the epics and its history, but at the same time, lead the readers to ponder on the issues which are not part of the objectives or themes of the original text. Okay, sorry, I need to ask you all, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, audible. thank you. Okay. Now, for example, this writer, Tanushri Poda, okay, uh, Escape from Harem, which was written in 1996, a novel which has the setting of the early 17th century India, when India was ruled by the Mughal Emperor uh, King Jahangir. Now, this novel chronicles the journey of a girl named Zinat, who is taken into the harem by Jahangir. She becomes a servant to Bahar Begum, a concubine, and later to Arjuman or Mumtaz. And it ends with the death of Mumtaz Mahal and the building of Taj Mahal. One must remember that no history can be truly objective or comprehensive because history is constantly examines the relationships of the literature of literature with the power structures of the society. Prior to the historical recordings by the historians on the Mughal dynasty and its emperors, this writer takes the readers one step closer to look into the traits and characters of these emperors. In short, this novel helps to humanize history. This approach allows readers to experience and have the feel of what life would have been like that uh, at that period of time. Now, looking from the new historicist point of view, as I told you, we need to apply theories to analyze these novels. According to new historicism, new historicism declares that the text must be analyzed through historical research that assumes that history and fiction are inseparable. As reiterated by Bressler, history and fiction seem to go hand in hand in the works of some of these writers, as these types of novels arouse the reader's curiosity to do a parallel reading of this text, which with the recorded history of the historians. More often than not, historians are selective and manipulative with events. In order to understand this, one just have to look at the way the Japanese school history books depict the Second World War soldiers as heroes and conveniently omit all the untold atrocities committed by them. But that is not the case with historical fiction. Many of the Indian contemporary writers have adapted to rewrite some of the historical episodes that took place in India. Another writer who is to be noted is Ashwin Sanghi. Sangeet, The Krishna Key, is a thriller novel that provides an incredible alternative interpretation of the Vedic age that will be released by conspiracy buffs. In this novel, historian Ravi Mohansaini must breathlessly detach from the submerged remains of Dwaraka and the mysterious lingam of Somnath to the icy heights of Mount Kailash in a quest to discover the crypt location of Krishna's most prized possession. The story of Lord Krishna is presented as an autobiography at the beginning of, of each new chapter, followed by the story of the present. This is, an, this is also an example of intertextuality 
as the story takes the readers back to history from the ruins of Kalibangan to the Vrindavan temple, which was destroyed by Aurangzeb. Gentlemen, the protagonist, Saini, must also Madam, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, okay, I think I need to share uh, the screen again, yeah? Yes. And that's not uh, I think I need to share my screen, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma thank you. Now it's okay, ma'am. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Sangi further. Oh. Can you can you see the slides? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma it's visible. Okay. okay. Because I received uh, some other signal here. Okay. Thank you. He further explains how the Taj Mahal was once a Hindu Raja's palace that was given to Shah Jahan so that he could create a final resting place for his queen. Okay, so he goes on to explain the symbols on Taj Mahal. Okay, now, these statements definitely arouse the curiosity of the readers to do a parallel reading to find out further about this issue. So this is where the paradigm shift takes place in teaching literature. Okay, whereby we need to use new historicism to teach literature here. Am I audible? Yes, yes ma'am, you are. Ma uh, uh, can you, uh, can, I need, to, uh, my video, my video yes, is. Yes, ma'am, we are able to see Okay, you. can you see the video? Yes, can it's you clear, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, okay. we are able to, we are able to see oh, your video, you video so also. Much. Okay, one must remember that fictional texts actually have no reason to manipulate facts while historians look at the events as mere recordings of fact without indulging into inner thoughts characters and their feelings <clears throat> sangi's other novels such as chanakya's chant and rosabel line also demonstrate the same style of writing whereby we have to apply the theory of new historicism to teach students and scholars another writer by the name of Christopher Doyle, yeah, who has come up with a similar trend. Okay, his best-selling novels are The Mahabharata Secret, The Mahabharata Quest, The Alexander's Secret, A Secret Revealed, and The Secret of Druids. The Mahabharata Secret is about Vijay and his friends who have to de decrypt a series of clues which leads them to an overwhelming secret hidden by a brotherhood known as the nine men who were created by the emperor Ahsoka. In, this, in, this, in the same style of writing, there is another writer, okay? She's Indu Sundaresan, yeah? Her novel, The Shadow Princess, takes the readers to 17th century India as two princesses struggle for supremacy of their father's kingdom. Trapped in the shadow of the magnificent tomb that their grief-stricken father is building for his beloved deceased wife, the emperor's daughters compete for everything. Control over the imperial harem, their father's affection, and the future of their country. They are forbidden to marry and instead choose to back different brothers in the fight for ultimate power over the throne. <clears throat> but only one of the sisters will succeed. Sundresen picks up where she left off in her novels titled 
the 20th wife and the Feast of Roses to take the readers another peek to the past. Now, reading these novels takes one to the realm of the Mughal period. She depicts the life of women in confinement in the harem at that time. Now, from the surface, Sh Shadow Princess may look like a narration to highlight the profound history of one of the most celebrated works of architecture in the world, the Taj Mahal. But one has to look deeper to understand how this author, with an enthusiasm for history and a flair for rich detail, brings the readers deep into the complicated lives of Indian women of that time period. As claimed by Bressler, history can never provide us with the truth or give us a totally accumulate picture of past events or the worldview of a small, of a group of people. This can only be done by fictional historians like these writers. They are not only capable to put forward the case of an event like the historians do, but have the ability to indulge further to incorporate the feelings and the sentiments engulfing the people involved in that particular incident. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is a grave mistake if anyone is to think that all these novels which draw the story from the essence of literature of the yesteryears are mere alternate style of storytelling to satiate the over enthusiastic crave for writing by some writers. And it is even a bigger sin if we were to brush them aside as a genre which came forth due to the lack of original substance or imagination among the writers. Instead, am I audible? Thank you. Instead, yes, there is a certain, a very profound philosophical messages hidden deep beneath these creative narrations, capitalizing on the epics of the past. Now, so subtle were the messages camouflaged in the attire of yesteryears that it demands a sensitive reader, a critical mind, and a sympathetic insight to comprehend the purpose of these new trends. It is true that Tanush Porter's escape from harem and Indus Sundresen's shadow princess highlights the Mughals as great builders. And one significant monument that is seen as one of the wonders of the world, the Taj Mahal. But at the same time, we cannot be oblivious to the fact that Porter and Sundresen, through their careful dissection on the lifestyle, romance, revenge, infighting, jealousy, lust, brutality, inhumanity, cruelty, and retribution to those hiding behind the heavily guarded fortress has also taken advantage to tear the masks of the highly acclaimed Mughal rulers. One cannot help but to wonder if the authors are not deliberately trying to question the justification of name and fame awarded by history to this dynasty which savaged Hindu India demolished 60,000 tem Hindu temples. Yeah, and denying the descendants of this land to inherit the rich heritage of their ancestors. After all, this is the dynasty which whose reign in the Deccan Plateau cost almost 20 million lives. Now, it is, is it not what is also being done by Sanghi when he depicts the Vrindavan temple destroyed by Aurangzeb in his novel, The Krishna Key, at the same time, Sanghi did not only produce a thriller novel based on Lord Krishna's earthly presence, but also opened the eyes of the world to the avatar concept that stressed on the existence of divinity within oneself, which is a distinctive philosophy of the land of Bharat alone. Meanwhile, Christopher Doyle, with his best selling novels, The Mahabharata Secret, The Mahabharata Quest, The Alexander Secret, took it upon himself to highlight to the world the majesty of kingdom of the olden India, while at the same time taking advantage to one to open one's eyes of the present generation to the grandeur of Mahabharata and the theological nectar contained in Srimad Bhagavatam, which is a part of the great epic. Now, picking onto the past and rewriting the epics or history of yesteryears seem to be the paradigm shift among the contemporary Indian writers. Likewise, the teachers and teaching of literature too has to make a paradigm shift 
to teach these kind of literature. In a world that is gushing forward in the quest for development and achievement, it may puzzle some of us on why the Indian writers choose to go backward. Maybe the words by Mark Twain can throw some light to this question. Very elo eloquently, he declares, India is the cradle of human race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of history, the grandmother of legend, and the great grandmother of tradition. Our most valuable and, valuable and most abstractive materials in, in the history of men are treasured up in India only. Now, the Indian writers are well aware of this. They knew their origin, the valor of their tradition and the height of their philosophy and the supremacy of their spirituality. Thus, unlike their counterparts in the Western world who are obsessed with an imaginary future of virtual environments and characters from future human evolution as cyborgs, superhuman, humanoids, androids, artificial intelligent robots, the Indian writers are too grounded intellectually, emotionally and spiritually to dwell into this unreal world. The Westerners need to create an imaginary futuristic world because they have no solid philosophical, cultural or religious backing, except for the Greek and the Romans, the entire Europe, was still engulfed in cultural darkness when the Indians were already chanting the mantras from the four Vedas. The Vedic era has reached its zenith almost 1,500 years before the coming of Christ. Buddha's eight noble paths were in practice in this land almost 500 years before the term Christianity came into being. The one nation that symbolizes modernization and development of the Western world today, namely Britain, were inhabited by uncivilized barbarians when the Indians were dwelling in the state of art cities of Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa. And the states of America did not even exist at that time. So these Indian writers with such a magnificent origin and a rock solid religious and philosophical foundation have no reason to play peekaboo with the uncertain future. They prefer to consolidate the gems of the past and pass it on to enhance humanity. While the Westerners with the limitation in their heritage can't help asking what is there in the past, but the Indians can safely ask, what is there not in our past. So they found a way to retell the many stories from the vast collection of Vedas, Puranas, Ramayana, and Mahabharata to enrich the human race. Indian fiction writers may retell mythology because they may relate the ancient past to the present. Just like the tiger retreats to gain momentum for a greater leaf, these writers turn back to sip the nectar in the vast ocean of their tradition to spray it to sweeten the path ahead for the betterment of mankind. With that note, I end my keynote. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Now, I request the participants to ask their questions to the respectful, resourceful person. Um, yes. Ma'am? Yes. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Yes, um, I, I wanted to um, ask about how is the paradigm shift mm -hmm. uh, in teaching language uh, with respect to uh, history? Teaching language in, with respect to history? Yeah. Well, you see, uh, if, you're, if you're teaching history, you, are, you will be using your language, right? Whatever language you are using as a medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, as I, as I mentioned early, earlier, we are... Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear oh, you. Ma. Okay. Oh, all right. Sorry, the screen is showing something else here. Okay. Now, uh, when, we, when we take up teaching history, now we no longer use 
blackboard and chalk and talk. You see, now we have lots of videos on history and we, we have lots of beautiful pictures. Yeah, so we can show them, show them through uh, your computer. Right. Mm -hmm. So use the technology, use the technology to teach literature, uh, sorry, to, to teach history, whereby there are so many recordings. If you are teaching uh, literature of partition of India, for example, yeah, partition of India. So yeah, what you can do is you can always play the video of uh, the March past at the Waga border to, mm -hmm. to your students as a set induction. And then you go on teaching about the partition of India. Mm -hmm. You get what I mean? So uh, yes. that, that is the way we make it creative. So that okay. to attract the attention of the students, because, you know, literature, I mean, sorry, history is sometimes boring for certain students. Yeah, not mm -hmm. all of them are keen to learn history. Yeah, in order to attract the attention, we have to come up with various methods. Yeah, one example is uh, videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Madam Chairperson? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, mm. Participants are welcome to ask questions. You can please type your questions in the chat box. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, that would be better. Uh, and the chairperson will be able to answer. Participants are expected to type the questions in the chat box. I think there are no questions. I, uh, I think uh, your presentation was very clear and uh, participants, I think. Yes, ma'am, there is another question from uh, Dr. Kartiga Devi. It is not a question, but an uh -uh. observation, I think. Yeah, so. exactly. Uh, it is a good idea to have a course exclusively on historical, historical novels. novels. Yeah. Oh, oh, there is a question mark there. I think it, I, um, I think it's not necessary because historical novels are also part of the part of literature. Yeah, um, I don't think we need to have a course ex exclusively on historical novels. Yeah, otherwise uh, uh, you won't find everybody reading them. <laughs> it should be. It should be a. a, a uh, just a course. If you, if you are talking about Indian literature, uh, Indian literature can comprise of uh, uh, novels uh, and historical novels, ordinary novels and historical novels. That's how I do the selection for my for my teaching of Indian literature. I include is historical novels in in, uh, in my subject as well. If I can add on, yeah, uh, uh, one more suggestion. Uh, this is for the uh, teachers. Huh? You see, uh, histor historical novels, uh, using historical novels will be good in teaching uh, Indian literature because uh, historical novels uh, will give an opening to the history of India. Okay, so uh, therefore, introducing these novels, for example, I normally start with uh, teaching uh, Duryodhana. You know, there is a novel uh, titled Duryodhana. 
uh, where where uh, the writer uses a different approach where Duryodhana is given a voice, the voice of the silenced people, okay, in Mahabharata. So I normally start with that and then I go on with uh, uh, other novels. So, I mean, uh, by using, using historical novels to teach Indian literature, um, uh, uh, that will give an opportunity uh, for students to know the history of India. Okay, I think there's another question. What events language present in historical novels or the historical fiction? Uh, I don't quite understand this question. Um. Uh, you're asking uh, about the authors today? Okay, I um, here, if you see, um, by presenting historical novels or historical fiction, okay, uh, I think I uh, spoke in my keynote that it is very important for the younger generations today to know the history of India. Yeah, the philosophy, the philosophy, okay, uh, which is which is uh, forgotten in writings of today. Yeah, so as I told earlier, there are only a small number of people, contemporary Indian writers, uh, currently, who are writing historical novels. Okay, by reading these novels and by applying new historicism as the theory to analyze these novels, students will get the opportunity to look back into the history. Were the history written in the textbooks are, uh, uh, are all true? Yeah, uh, is it really authentic? Is something not presented in the history books? Okay, so um, it arouses the creative thinking in the students. Okay, so um, that is why these historical fictions and uh, the shift uh, in the paradigm in the works of uh, contemporary Indian writers is very important for uh, the progress of Indian literature in Indian subcontinent. Any more questions? Participants, feel mm -hmm. free to ask questions to ma'am. Okay, I guess yes. that should end the session. <laughs> Thank you very much. And wanna okay. come to all of you. Okay, ma'am, uh, that was a very informative and interesting session, ma'am. Uh, you have touched upon the previous uh, uh, epic stories which have been narrated into um, uh, fiction, which will be relevant and useful for the present generation. We have come to know a lot about um, the writers, new writers who are trying to uh, instill the epic culture in through their literature, present literature. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, that uh, information that you have provided us. It, it has actually uh, broadened our horizons in different perspectives of literature and uh, the new nuances in literature. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank uh, you. And moving on to the next session of the day, we have uh, 
parallel talks which is delivered by dr mahendran manian which the session will be chaired by dr v s sasikala shakila sorry assistant professor of english uh, sfr college uh, sivagasi uh, a small introduction to our resource person of the day uh, dr mahendran is a faculty of language and communication and he is an associate professor and his areas of research is uh, in applied linguistics and he has done an extensive research in the field of second language acquisition and language learning strategy and he is currently conducting research and he supervises uh, for doctoral and mass uh, post graduate students and uh, i think sir is a uh, uh, a brilliant person and he has um, his uh, research and his extensive research in the field of applied linguistics and linguistics is going to give us a better perspective of uh, the nuances of language learning and language teaching over to you sir thank you so much thank you thank you uh, to the chairperson um, can you hear me yes sir we can hear yes sir okay okay uh, because this is a online thing uh, there's always a technical glitch and uh, i hope this uh, will uh, have a smooth sail uh, after this okay i'm um uh, associate professor dr mahendran maniam i belong to sultan idris education university okay uh, i have to mention my university's name because um, uh this is a requirement uh, from the university i'm not promoting my university but there is a requirement from the university whenever we go online international we have to mention a uh, little bit about our university okay so i belong to sultan idris education university the number one education university uh, in malaysia okay so going online is a bit difficult uh? this is just uh, some stories before i start the proper before i share my screen <laughs> okay uh so i've been in the industry for more than 30 years uh this is my 32nd or third year lost track of number of years uh, teaching um but anyhow um going online and teaching uh, language teaching being conducted online is uh, a new thing for everyone eh? especially uh people like me who have uh, people like me who actually come from two different generation eh? baby boomers and uh, x generation and y generation i'm i'm a baby boomer and i have to handle all these um, y generation students so there i have to be in both world eh? the the real face to face world and also the online world eh? which is new for me okay so first of all i take this uh, opportunity to welcome everyone to 3 day bodhi international congress and international online conference uh, which will be held for 3 days and um, with the team uh, paradigm shifts in teaching language literature and culture okay and i also take this opportunity to thank um, uh, the um, research department of english uh, american college uh, bodhi international journal uh, especially dr bala uh, and also in association with the university of jammu from jammu and kashmir department of english women's christian college research department of english uh, the standard fireworks rajaratnam college for women okay uh, from uh, sivagasi tamil nadu i think um, uh, if uh, any lecturers from um, american uh, college uh, uh, you should know me i have uh, spoken in american college yeah, madurai um, so uh, thank you again for inviting me yeah? uh, madam can i share my screen now yes sir <clears throat> okay i i hope uh, the slide is uh, clear yes sir your slide is visible all right my my audio is it okay clear yes sir yes sir it is clear all right all right thank you thank you okay uh, introduction about me is done uh, now when we talk about paradigm shift in education um, many people might be asking what is uh, paradigm shift uh, even having this uh, online uh, 
lecture as a keynote speaker. I've spoken from many international platform, but uh, nowadays everything is taking place from home. I'm, I'm actually sitting in my bedroom. I don't have to go to my office because of um, uh, COVID, uh, the pandemic. Uh, so I've been asked to work from home. So this is uh, something new for me. Uh, so uh, even if you see uh, my uh, video, uh, uh, I'm using some small mini spotlights here and there. Uh, so I do not know how to adjust uh, the lighting system. Uh, only the Gen Y and Gen X generation, they know. Uh, so I'm not very familiar with all these things. Uh, anyhow, you have to learn. So this is, uh, this is uh, actually a paradigm shift in language teaching. Yeah? Uh, so I've been teaching language for more than 30 years. So this is a real paradigm shift because uh, we have to go online. All right. So what are the changes going to take place after this? We'll, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about it. Okay. So what is actually a paradigm shift? A paradigm shift is a radical change, yeah? a quick, fast change. Uh, that is um, in the core concepts and practices of a given domain, uh, discipline or field. Paradigm shifts can occur at any of these levels and may cut across these levels, the field of education at both the basic and higher education levels has undergone tremendous uh, changes since World War II. Uh, next slide. Uh, so what is actually the shift uh, it's all about if you haven't stepped into a language classroom in the last 15 years, you may be surprised to learn just how different the experience has become. Eh? To, to an extent, uh, people say if you are teaching in the 21st century, uh, you should not have a blackboard or whiteboard or whatever board in your uh, classroom. Okay, in, in, in terms of the teaching, not only in terms of teaching languages, but any other subjects because a teacher's role uh, has changed uh, over the years. Uh, so a teacher is more of a facilitator. So we should be able to facilitate the learning uh, because information is just a click away. This is what I tell my students. Uh, information is just a click away. Anyone uh, with a small handphone can get all the information that they want, uh, regardless of uh, where they are. Okay. So apart from the black box turning white and now computerized, I think most of the classrooms have uh, computerized uh, Blackboard and beyond the digital tools that are becoming a more common site in schools, something more fundamental has evolved in the way that languages are taught. Now, language teaching in 19th and 20th, 20th century, uh, we, those who come from uh, my uh, generation, you should know for years, language teachers uh, found ways to make a naturally exciting topic into a deadly dull one. Eh? And I also noticed that uh, in India, everyone is uh, very fond of um, uh, using or learning uh, literature more than uh, English language teaching per se. Okay, so maybe whatever I'm going to talk about here about ELT might be a little bit uh, difficult to understand if you are a literature person. Okay, so uh, just now Dr. Mani Manga spoke and she spoke about uh, literature. She's a pure literature person, eh? and I'm a pure uh, ELT person, eh? English language teaching person. Okay, because my we are directly involved in producing English language teachers in, in, in the country. Okay, language teaching for most of the 20th century was heavily influenced by grammar translation of the 19th century, which involved uh, learning a new word or grammatical structure, translating it into your native language and memorizing it. Teaching was actually based on a strict syllabus of what educators considered to be important, whether it was relevant to students' needs or not. Okay, last time when we when we were teaching in the 70s and 80s, uh, we are more into strict syllabus based. Okay, uh, we don't care uh, whether uh, the syllabus is suitable for our students or not, as long as we cover the syllabus. Uh, uh, is is uh, your job is done, so you are a good educator. Huh? Okay, so um, I even during my younger days, huh, I used to tell uh, the younger ones, my, my colleagues, that um, it's not all about completing a syllabus, uh, finishing a syllabus, but uncovering the syllabus. Uncovering the syllabus means make the syllabus suitable for everyone. Okay, that although the syllabus is there, we should be able to 
uh, manipulate the syllabus so that it fits into uh, every learner. Okay, uh, so teaching was based on a strict syllabus of what educators considered to be important, whether it was relevant to students' needs or not. This led many people to think they were bad at languages. Techniques gradually adapted to be more situational. So grammar and vocabulary would be taught in contexts in which you might realistically use it. But the emphasis was still very much on reading, repeating, memorizing, the same thing. Okay. So the development of a communicative approach, eh? uh, if you have uh, noticed this eh? in 1990, 1987, 88, uh, and early 90s, uh, everyone was talking about this. Eh? communicative approach in the last decades of 20th century, yeah? 1990 onwards uh, until the year 2000, uh, marked a major change in how languages were taught. The idea of communicative competence, uh, that means being able to successfully communicate, uh, replaced grammatical accuracy as the main goal of language teaching. Okay, so nowadays, um, that's why in many uh, Asian and ASEAN countries, you have languages that are uh, used only by that particular uh, community. Yeah? For example, in, in Malaysia, we have Manglish. In Singapore, we have uh, Singlish and so on. Okay? So because the main purpose uh, in, in uh, late uh, 90s were more on uh, communicating. Right? So um, what about language uh, teaching today? The ideas that came with communicative approach are still dominant in language teaching today. Um, for example, a focus on the needs of each group of students as opposed to using a rigid syllabus based on grammar and popularity of information gap exercises. Although great teaching comes first and foremost from a great teacher, technology is making a big difference. Eh? Please take note of this. Eh? Although great teaching comes from great teachers but technology is making a big difference in modern classrooms a huge variety of tools and exercises are available to teachers and this is a, this is the big shift that has taken place eh, in um, early 21st century an excellent teacher who is not it savvy will fail in a 21st century classroom so if you put a teacher who is not it savvy in the 21st century classroom the classroom and the teaching will fail miserably. So it is extremely significant for teachers who are in the 21st century to actually um, to be on par with the students. And the students most probably are from the uh, Y generation or even Z generation, uh, those who are uh, 20 plus and um, early 30s. Uh, for example, they from British study centers uh, identifies the smartphones as a potential tool for the classroom, as the current generation of learners are fluent users of the devices. Apps such as Memrise and Enki, yeah? uh, you can Google for these two um, um, apps. Um, they, they started to give it free, but now I think they are charging about US nine or $10. So it's not, uh, nothing is free anymore. And um, this, um, creators of these apps, they know they are becoming popular, then they start to charge the customers, okay? So, but anyhow, uh, you can Google or download this from Play Store, uh, Memrise, Memrise and Enki, yeah? These two apps um, are quite good. Yeah? Uh, uh, work of uh, memorization into a game and can be an excellent additions to traditional classrooms. Now, if you are talking about 21st century uh, language learning and teaching, implementation of ICT oriented language education, at the turn of 21st century, there are many changes uh, in the role of education in the world, especially an addition of uh, digital literacies in education. Okay, so uh, digital uh, literacies has actually taken over. Uh, in fact, uh, later I will give you a little bit on um, uh, Bloom's uh, taxonomy. Uh, even um, uh, Benjamin Bloom's, um, uh, Bloom's taxonomy has been uh, revised and then later has been uh, revised into digital, uh, Bloom's digital taxonomy. Okay, I will give you the link uh, after this. Okay, some people were born with 
technologies surrounding them and become native users of technology language. Or as uh, Pransky, uh, 2001, points this idea with the term digital natives. Okay, digital natives are people who are born with digital devices around them. Some people as those born in the 19th and 20th century, uh, however, become digital immigrants. Eh? Pransky terms them as uh, digital immigrants. Eh? We become beggars. We have to ask people's, people who are born in digital as digital natives to help us to um, uh, teach us to use uh, digital uh, gadgets, actually, who need to adapt themselves to the emergence of technology. Comparing new generations with older generations, we might face a big gap in understanding each other, especially in terms of education and language learning. To be more specific, English education among various disciplines might seem to be learnable and teachable from different perspectives. This is by um, uh, John Sutherland eh, in 2004. As for digital immigrants, using printed materials seem to be safer and more comfortable to use than learning and reading from e-books, for example. On the other hand, uh, digital natives might learn a foreign language faster and better when they play online games or interact with their online friends. Eh? Okay, even even now, uh, uh, I have actually uh, diverted eh, from my since I'm into applied linguistics. Uh, usually, um, digital um, uh, sorry, digital. I was not using uh, Bloom's uh, digital taxonomy in. Um, preparing exam papers and so on. But now I've already started to divert my research into how to associate uh, language uh, teaching in accordance with uh, Bloom's uh, digital taxonomy. So people out there who are teaching, uh, who are into ELT, English language teaching, or any other language teaching per se, uh, for this matter, you have to uh, look into um, how Bloom's digital taxonomy is utilized in uh, uh, creating or packaging uh, a curriculum uh, for the current generation. Uh. This is the biggest shift that I have seen in 35 years of teaching. Uh. So this paradigm shift is inevitable. Uh, either you sail with it or you have to sink. So embedding uh, technology in language learning and teaching. As information and communications technology, eh, ICT becomes part of everyday practices in the 21st century, it is important to note that digital immigrant educators implement and try to include technology in routine teaching and learning. At a broad level, especially in Asia and the Pacific, eh, uh, UNESCO 2003 conducted a series of ICT trainings for teachers. The aims were to develop teachers' ICT skills for every aspect of teaching and learning core subjects and to develop individual computer literacies for practical purposes. The study was concluded with a successful story of general understanding in terms of computer implementation in education and policy. However, some specific issues uh, such as troubleshooting and technical, uh, take note of this, uh, uh, not only uh, the, the paradigm shift is not only aligning yourself with digital world but you must also, and um, you know like just now we had just uh, of uh, troubleshooting the technical maintenance extending training facilities and programs and continuing support will still of a great concern in the continuing success of training so uh, the trainers uh, the ict trainers find it difficult because uh, training you on how to use an app is one thing but training you on how to troubleshoot uh, that particular uh, problem, technical problems eh, uh, that we might encounter is another issue. So um, wherever I go to schools, uh, I always tell them to actually uh, hire eh, a, a technical guy. Eh? Now we must have a, a technical guy in every department so that uh, uh, teaching of um, uh, a particular subject, especially teaching of uh, 
languages, can language, unlike other subjects, uh, language, uh, digital taxonomy. Uh, this is uh, what I said earlier. This is a uh, hello. Are you there? Yes. Can you hear me, please? Yes, sir. In between, we had a voice break in between, sir. Uh, but the, the video, I cannot in on. Yeah, no, it's I, clear, sir. Uh, but I cannot on my video. You cannot start your video because the host has uh, stopped it. I'll just check, sir. Can you check with the host? Yes, sir. Uh, I'll check. Someone please. has. my video okay thank you my internet is uh, quite uh, uh, powerful uh, so should I should not have any problem here uh, is my voice clear now yes sir your voice is clear all right uh, so I continue with the uh, Bloom's uh, digital taxonomy yeah? um, so last time everyone was very fond of using uh, in uh, in uh, uh, when they create um, a syllabus or they come out with a new curriculum, uh, Bloom's taxonomy yeah, without the digital is very popular. Yeah? Benjamin Bloom's, who's an American psychologist, his uh, Bloom's uh, taxonomy, we have low order thinking skills, high order thinking skills. So uh, was quite popular. So now, nowadays, uh, when you uh, design a syllabus, uh, when you design a curriculum, you have to include Bloom's uh, digital taxonomy, yeah, which is totally uh, uh, different from Bloom's uh, original taxonomy. Okay, so a growing concern is being voiced on educating the modern digital student. As of now, the landscape of education can be considered that of a revolution, uh, with technology being the engine powering it. Okay, if you don't have technology, it's like having a Mercedes Mercedes car, and you do not know how to drive. Uh, it's the same thing. The proliferation of uh, technology has given birth to the biggest generational gap since the induction of rock and roll music. However, the field of education has yet to structure teaching and learning to match millennial generation. Uh, millennial generation is actually uh, Gen uh, Y, yeah? Gen Y, Generation Y. Yeah? Okay, this is uh, just um, um, for your information, different age groups um, in language learning, not only language learning. So this group is for all, eh? whatever subject you're teaching, you should know eh? which uh, group uh, you belong to. Um, we have baby boomers who were born in 46 and 64. Then we have uh, Gen X, uh, those who were born from 65 and 80. I, I belong to Gen X. Then we have the Gen Y. Yeah? Gen Y are millennials, also known as millennials, uh, born between 1980 to 94. They are currently 24 to 39 years old. Yeah? Uh, so these are the this is the generation that uh, I am teaching in the university now. Yeah? Those who are about 25 to 29. Yeah? My master's students are all about 25 to 29. And we also have Gen Z. Yeah? Gen Z is the newest generation. Yeah? They are even stronger than the Gen X. Okay, so because um, as um, technology is all about, uh, it's very dynamic. Eh? It, it keeps on changing every few months. So not only we must learn about uh, technology to teach a language, but uh, we must also have to keep up with the latest um, technology. Okay, uh, Language learning and the digital student. Eh? A growing concern is being voiced on education educating the modern digital student. As of now, the landscape of education can be considered that of a revolution with technology being the engine powering it. I have already read this, I think. Okay, sorry. It is no secret that many forms of technology, yeah, like uh, wikis, blogs, education games, and there are many, yeah, thousands of apps online, 
exists and um, available to the students at little or no cost. Uh, that's why uh, my, my popular tagline is information is just a click away. Okay. Uh, so if we do not know how to facilitate, then uh, we will be left behind and the students will overtake us. Okay. So because our role is more on facilitating uh, in terms of language teaching, our role is more on facilitating. Uh. However, if educators were to use these forms of technology correctly or in conjunction with lesson planning, the bridge between education and technology would be lesser. The problem is that technological innovations need to be transformed from tools of obsession into tools of education. Okay, uh, last time, uh, I, I do not know um, the system in India, uh, but I think it should be the same. Huh? Last time, uh, students are not, uh, students were not allowed to bring in uh, handphones huh, to classrooms. But nowadays, uh, with all these uh, pandemic issues, it's a global issue. And uh, it's a must for students to have uh, an advanced uh, handphone uh, in order for learning to take place because we have Google Classroom, we have Zoom sessions, we have Google Meet and so many sessions. Uh. So um, this is the biggest paradigm shift, not only in language teaching and learning, but overall uh, in the education industry. I'm going to talk about it after this. Okay, Instructional technology has altered the way students are learning, making them 21st century learners, but have teachers become 21st century educators? Uh, this is my question now. The students, Gen Y and Gen Z, they are all prepared for the 21st century as learners, but uh, are the teachers prepared? Uh, these are the things that we should ask ourselves. Okay, collaboration is not only a 21st century skill, but has been deemed essential to move forward which is by churches. Huh? Churches is the one who uh, introduced uh, Bloom's digital taxonomy. Okay, Collaboration in this context does not refer to people working together, but the fusion of traditional frameworks and theories with technology to enrich the learning experience and excite student curiosity. Okay, Now, Andrew Churches is the person who proposed uh, digital taxonomy. I think... Um, uh, I just quickly read this because I've already said so much about him. Andrew Churches first proposed Bloom's digital taxonomy in 2001 and noted that this taxonomy is not restricted to the cognitive domain. It contains cognitive elements. One of digital taxonomy, Churches added a number of digital additions to each uh, key term uh, in Bloom's revised taxonomy which can be found, uh, you, you can get it online, huh? not Appendix D, I do not have, I did not append it here, but uh, you can Google to check on this, uh, revised um, Bloom's uh, digital taxonomy, okay? Um, all right, next one. Um, this is um, uh, something that I popularly um, use in my classrooms. Huh? Uh, information is just a click away. Huh? So uh, it's difficult to handle these kind of students because they are always with this gadget and they are full of uh, information. So whether they're going to make it to good use or not, it depends on the educators who are actually uh, the moderators. Uh, I just give one example eh, from uh, Bloom's uh, digital taxonomy. Um, for example, in, in um, the old version, uh, we have um, uh, this item called remember. Okay, this is the lowest uh, um, low level thinking skills. Okay, uh, last time when we want the students to remember, we ask them to recognize and recall certain things. Okay, for that, we ask them questions like this. Okay, questions for low order thinking skills eh, for remember. We ask them what happened after that, huh? how many, what is, who was, can you name that particular thing or person or whatever. Okay, so this was how it was organized uh, before the paradigm shift uh, took place. Now with the paradigm shift, which has taken place, uh, students using all these modern gadgets, and we include uh, digital, uh, Bloom's uh, digital taxonomy, we ask the questions in this form. Huh? online 
uh, you can include remembering, but you cannot ask them questions online. What you can ask them to do is, these are the examples, eh? uh, the digital addition eh, to the key term remembering. You can ask them to bullet pointing. You can ask them to highlight. You ask them to bookmark. You can ask them to social bookmark. You can ask them to Google. Okay, so these are the things that you can ask them to do. Uh, sorry, eh? these are the things you can ask them to do if you are using Bloom's uh, digital taxonomy. When you give them online work and you want them to memorize, remember something, uh, these are the things that you can ask them to do. Eh? Bullet point. This is um, an analog to thing, yeah, but in a digital format. Uh, this is only one item. Eh? I'm telling you another three. So there are six uh, items there, which you have to learn on how to use them online to assess and to make your online learners to learn. Um, I, I gave a talk on Bloom's uh, Digital Taxonomy in um, uh, Dr. NGR University Chennai yeah, a few weeks ago, I think, or last month, I don't remember. So uh, it is in YouTube. Yeah? You can actually uh, go to the YouTube and uh, listen to how to use Bloom's uh, Digital Taxonomy in your teaching. Okay, uh, the, the complete info is there. Okay, now we talk about uh, what is the current trend. Eh? So we, we, we have the 19th century, we have the 20th century. Now we talk about 21st century. I've mentioned many things about uh, the instruments that you can use, the, what are the paradigm shifts that have taken place. So, but I haven't said much about the current trends. Eh? So the current trend that um, uh, major paradigm shift that has taken place will be uh, for example, uh, there are many, but I'm just sharing some. Uh, uh, blended learning. As teachers combine digital media with more traditional forms of teaching, their cost materials and resources reflect the trend. Most learning institutions combine face-to-face -face teaching and online lessons. For teachers who want to be want to pepper their everyday teaching with practical online activities, there are many online platforms available for teaching of languages. Okay. Uh, this this is also happening, taking place in my university, even before the pandemic, eh? before COVID-19, uh, lecturers were asked to uh, use uh, blended learning. Eh? So we have a platform for blended learning to take place. Uh, in that platform, we can actually share our video, share our slides, our PPT and so on, eh? our notes, and we can give them uh, questions to be answered in the form of a forum, in the form of WhatsApp, Many things there. So uh, I think universities also uh, must uh, be must be prepared to create then it will be difficult uh, for online or blended learning to take place. Okay, another current trend will be uh, mobile learning. Uh, of course, uh, this is uh, quite uh, popular now. So they use all kinds of uh, online resources via their phone. Um, some of the examples uh, of um, the apps that you can use to learn a language here, I've already given, uh, Essential English, Wordable, and so on. Uh, all these, you can Google it and get it. Uh, you can download the app also from Play Store and uh, you can try it out with the video students. Huh? I'm talking in terms of teaching a language. Maybe for uh, history and um, geography or mathematics, you might have uh, some other apps. Okay. Uh, gamification is another trend now. Huh? Appealing to football lovers. Learn Match is another uh, app. Users. sessions friendly matches leaks young learners okay so 
uh, is uh, another app that you can download. You use visual, audio, and hands-on activities to stimulate and or if you can screenshot or if you can copy uh, some of the apps that I've shared here. Uh, I'm, I'm not a very app person, eh? but because I'm a language uh, instructor, so I have to know a few apps that helps in language learning, okay? Because that is uh, very useful for the current situation, okay? Uh, this is another uh, trend, eh? creating and sharing content. Eh? Uh, while there's much online content already out there for learners, some programs take note of these. Eh? Some programs and apps allow learners to produce their own content and share what they have created with others. Okay, this is uh, I find this uh, interesting because uh, we have many, many thousands of them eh, online. But these apps they allow you to create. You can be very innovative. Create your own. Uh, what do you call this table, questionnaires, questionnaire maybe, okay, um, question paper, exam paper, and share it um, in this app so that others also will be able to use uh, whatever that you have created, okay. Um, now, after looking at all the new trends, the paradigm shifts, uh, this is uh, something that is happening now eh, for the past few months. Uh, we are going through a um, uh, biggest paradigm shift um, because of uh, COVID-19. The pandemic has uh, taken away uh, more than 1.3 million lives. Uh, and uh, everyone is um, in, in a very uh, difficult situation now. Uh, but I, I was told by my friends, lecturers in India, that in India, uh, they have learned to take it as part and parcel of, the li of their lives and everyone is going out and uh, doing their daily uh, routine. But in uh, many other countries, especially countries like Malaysia, uh, we have to adhere to the government ruling. Yeah? If you break the law, you'll be arrested and uh, you'll be charged in court. Okay, So um, the threat of the pandemic, yeah? is causing a series of transformations in the different spheres uh, of social, political, labor, and economic life. Uh. Different governments have launched emergency policies. Okay, we, we don't talk about governments. We go to the educational part. Okay. The current situation of education in the context of pandemic caused by COVID-19, the worldwide health emergency situation has caused the confinement of people and with it, the closure of centers and transfer of face-to-face -face education to online education. Faced with these facts, teachers have had to adapt at a dizzying pace, eh? not only to new methodological approaches, but also to their own confinement, presenting high levels of um, stress. Uh, teachers, not only students are stressful, but uh, teachers too are very stressful uh, because of this paradigm shift, uh, because the universities are closed. And uh, um, the, the most important part, uh, the most uh, stressful part is uh, we did not anticipate this. So we were not prepared for an uh, online um, class. So uh, that is something that is very stressful. Eh? An example of a study to address this issue will be on how to optimize the work of education professionals in the current context of a pandemic through the use of ICT under the novel approach of contributions, neuroeducation. Uh, neuroeducation here, we are talking about mind and brain education in the field of managing emotions and motivational process, contributing to meaningful learning in students. Uh, okay. So um, I think many people have already, uh, lecturers have already started to publish articles related to how to manage uh, stress during this uh, pandemic. Uh, and um, they have uh, realized that uh, the stress level of students, not only students, the educators too, is at a very high level. So that requires uh, the government and uh, the authority to also uh, consider Conducting uh, neuro education.
Instead of the teacher, we have 92.8 and C, to the confirm assistance education. It means were the main problems pointed, pointed out by our teachers. Huh? I, I personally interviewed uh, many teachers and uh, most of them agreed to this, that uh, they are in a very chaotic situation huh, because of this uh, distance education. Huh? Uh, working from home is a stressful thing for educators and studying from home is a stressful situation uh, for the students. Okay. Uh, some of the students I interviewed, uh, the earlier assumption was uh, students prefer to stay at home and study at home. But uh, in the beginning, they enjoyed it. When the uh, closure of schools and institutions was stretched to more than six months, now all of them are under great stress. Okay, So possible difficulties facing such policies include poor online teaching infrastructure. Uh, many students say that uh, the educators are not giving them enough information. Because if you were to take Zoom sessions, that will last only for uh, 45 minutes. And if you have to use Zoom session more than that, you have to pay. Then um, there comes another question, who is going to pay? Is it the teacher or the students or the government? Okay, so that's a big uh, controversial thing going on now. Okay. Uh, this, this is, these are the consequences of closure of educational centers. Uh, in terms of uh, food, in terms of poor training of parents. Even parents are not prepared. Even most of the parents I interviewed, they say they are not prepared and they don't want the students to study from home because they say students uh, are not learning according to their uh, assumption. Eh? Uh, that they say uh, distance learning, students are not prepared for distance learning. So therefore, parents find it very difficult. Eh? Uh, to accept it. Okay. Um, these are the economic consequences. Okay, I skip this. Okay, uh, this one is very important. How prepared are we with the shift? A recent report highlighted several problems facing the educational system. The pandemic has faced, has forced the immediate transfer of teaching to online modality without time to carry out authentic planning and uh, modification of the curriculum design. Eh? The curriculum is still the same. It was not actually designed to be taught online, but we have to take the curriculum that was designed to teach face-to-face -face and then change it to do online things. Eh? Even the assessment, eh? if you talk about assessment, I was talking to uh, uh, an associate professor who is into testing and evaluation. According to her, uh, at, at this juncture, uh, testing and evaluation for online uh, requires a high level of integrity from the students because uh, students can actually uh, cheat if they want. Okay. So as I conclude today's talk, I see more online and blended language. Huh? This is what I see, uh, blended language teaching and learning to be part of our 21st century uh, language curriculum. So after this, when uh, designers, uh, curriculum designers, they design curriculums for language teaching. From what I see, it will be like 50 online learning or blended teaching and learning and another 50, only another 50 will be face to face. Okay, so I think um, that's all. I give it back to the MC. Uh, you can, um, if you have any questions, please forward your questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Participants, you're welcome to ask your questions. Please type in the questions in the chat box so that the resource person will answer the questions. Or you can also on your mic and ask me questions. Eh? Rather than typing, you can. Participants, if you have questions, you can turn on your mic and you can ask. Any questions? We have uh, 46 participants, I think. Uh, if you have questions, please. Uh, 
I'm waiting for questions. Otherwise, I have to hand, hand it over to the organizers. Any you won't questions? get a chance to, to talk to a lecturer from Malaysia after this. Uh, I'm very open about it. Any questions you can ask. Dr. Kavi Arasu is here. Okay, madam, I think... Good afternoon, sir. Was... How are you, sir? I'm good, I'm good. I uh, send my regards to Dr. Bala. Uh, yes, sir. It's a really informative session, sir. And uh, you have uh, thrown light on the new relevance of uh, uh, this uh, ELT. And also, you have uh, also what that, uh, introduced us the uh, digital uh, taxonomy, Bloom's taxonomy, which also would uh, be helpful in the future. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I guess no other questions, uh, madam. Uh, Dr. Yes. V.S. Shakila. Yes, sir. So there's there no question. No Can I stop here? Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, yeah. Sharada. Yes, yes, sir. Sharada, yes, okay. sir. Yeah. Uh, sir. Sir, okay. how can we use Bloom's taxonomy in assessment? Your question, please. Of a paper? Uh. How can we use Bloom's taxonomy in assessment of a test or something? If, if, you're, if you're preparing a question paper, yeah. How can we use Bloom's taxonomy? Yes, yes. Uh, you you must uh, use uh, Bloom's taxonomy for, for us in, in the university here. We use it for to set all, any kind of questions. Uh, we use uh, Bloom's uh, taxonomy as our benchmarking. Yeah? So all our questions, we must have uh, Bloom's, uh, we must abide by yeah? uh, Bloom's uh, taxonomy because uh, it, uh, it, covers actually everything you know because um, you you have um, um, items like uh, to remember uh, there must be a question on uh, to test the students on remember there must be a question to test the students on uh, understanding on on application uh, on analyzing evaluating and creating so you know we have uh, six items in bloom's uh, taxonomy yeah? three low order thinking skills and another three will be higher order thinking skills so uh, so we, when we ask questions uh, in the exam paper, we should cover all these uh, six items. In my university, when we set the questions, at the end of the question, we must mention whether it's a C1 or C2 uh, before it is uh, accepted uh, uh, for printing. They will check whether I have included uh, all the taxonomies uh, involved, uh, all the items involved in uh, Bloom's uh, taxonomy. Okay, uh, the highest level will be to create and the lowest level will be to remember. But when we convert that into digital taxonomy, in digital taxonomy, it will be different. Eh? Uh, for example, as I showed uh, you earlier, uh, to remember, you can ask the students, eh, if they are studying online, you can ask them to highlight, to, to favorite uh, a certain page and so on. Eh? When it comes to uh, the highest level, eh, of uh, Bloom's uh, digital taxonomy that is create. Uh, you can ask them to create a video uh, and post it in um, uh, YouTube and so on. Eh? Uh, so that's how we use it in our uh, assessment eh? in uh, universities and uh, even in the schools, not only in universities. When I observe my students who are teaching in schools, uh, when they set the questions for students, they are also supposed to uh, adhere to follow this uh, Bloom's uh, taxonomy so that uh, the paper has um, a good uh, quality yeah, in terms of that it caters for all levels of students, whether it's lower order thinking skills or higher order thinking skills. Okay, you, you can get it uh, all these um, online. Yeah? And, uh, in, uh, actually, it was introduced in 1956 by the American uh, educational psychologist Bloom's Benjamin. But later it was revised in 2001, and later it was revised again uh, by another person, uh, which is uh, Churches, uh, for to make it more digital friendly, only for the digital world. Okay. I hope I've answered your question. Sir, uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any, any other question? 
Okay. There are no more questions, sir. Okay. It was really you. a privilege to listen to your enlightening speech, sir. Uh, sorry, ma'am. I think there is a participant who wants to ask another question. Yeah. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Can I ask, uh, Dr. Mahendra? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, Which one do I answer first? There's one uh, in the text box. Solomon. Is it possible to assess all the questions in a class with K6 level questions? If you ask me for this uh, a question from Muttamil Silvi, I would say no. Huh? I would say no. If a good paper, a good assessment should cover all the six items huh, in Bloom's uh, taxonomy. Okay, coming back to someone who, who's uh, talking to yes. me now. Yes, sir. Uh, this is Dr. Solomon from Saudi Arabia, Jazani uh, University. Stay again, sir. Yeah, this is Dr. Solomon from Saudi Arabia, Jazani University. Hi, yes, yes, doctor. How are you? Yeah, fine, fine, doctor, sir. And, uh, thank you, doctor. It was uh, very informative and uh, it was uh, it has thrown light on uh, especially how uh, uh, digitally that we can educate uh, students, I think. Yes, yes, yes. So yes. Helpful. And uh, well, recently, actually, I wanted to be, uh, share one experience uh, from our side. Uh, I'm the head of the quality assurance here. Recently, okay, we, shifted, uh, we shifted uh, from uh, competence-based education to value-oriented education. So previously, okay, in our uh, uh, domains, we used to have knowledge and uh, skills and then competencies. Now we have knowledge, uh, skills, and values. So okay. they say that the values are there. So is there anything, something like a parallel which is going on in uh, Malaysia, uh, that the value-oriented education is also being... Uh, instead of competencies, competencies went into the skills and competencies together. And uh, this domain of values, which are very at the base, at the core of a student and values. Are yes, yes, Dr. Solomon, uh, that, that, that is uh, uh, compulsory. All, all our uh, uh, papers, all our syllabus, um, uh, these are soft skills, the value added things are embedded, embedded in the, in the program itself. We, we don't actually uh, uh, teach it directly in the classroom, but it, it is uh, embedded in the syllabus itself, either directly or indirectly, sir. So they are assessed, sir. Are they, are they assessed in the program, uh, PLOs, so program learning outcomes? Are they assessed? Uh, yes, yes. They, they, they are assessed. There are questions that are related to values also. But okay. uh, but apart from that, we, we have a system where we have to give them a score for the soft skills, whether this student has uh, discipline, whether he has attended all the classes, we have a column for every item, like one student will have uh, 10 columns, uh, all the soft skills will be assessed and the teacher has to tick all these things. And then every uh, two or three months, uh, it will be assessed and sent to the principal uh, to check. Uh, we can counter check uh, uh, their uh, values by checking on this. Only the classroom teacher, uh, the class teacher are given this task. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Okay, madam. I think I'm done. Yes. Thank you, sir. It was uh, you. really an enlightening speech, sir. And uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, it was uh, really informative and uh, it has definitely given us a lot of insights, especially during this phase of new normal, so which is the paradigm shift in education, sir. And uh, thank you for sharing with us some of the useful websites. Bloom's Digital yes. Taxonomy and Apps, which is yep. definitely the need of the hour for teachers like us. Yes, and in yes, terms sir. of education, sir, you are a visionary and we'll definitely incorporate your ideas in our teaching process. And thank so you, thank as you. you have rightly pointed out, information is just a click away. So we should use the modern multimedia technology effectively for developing proficiency in language and also adapt ourselves to the current trends and innovations in language teaching, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful speech. Yeah, yeah uh, all the organizers there, you have done a wonderful job. So uh, keep up your good work. Uh, God bless you. Uh, Want to come to all. Thank you. Thank you. When I come, sir. Thank you. Sir. Uh, before we sign off for this uh, morning session, dear participants, here are a couple of announcements. Uh, after every session, there will be a separate feedback link and attendance link. Uh, which will be sent in the chat box. Kindly make note of that. And you have to fill in the feedback form within half an hour's time. If not, uh, the link will expire and you cannot register your feedback. Neither can you register your attendance as well. 
So kindly note uh, and wait for the feedback link till the end of the session. And uh, after post lunch, the afternoon session at 2 p.m. It will commence at 2 p.m. And I request all the participants to sign in 10 minutes prior to uh, the beginning of the session. And the link for the session will be sent half an hour before. So kindly make uh, make sure that you uh, are you know keeping your uh, keeping in time and make sure that you fill in the feedback form. Any other uh, queries and all that, you can please contact the organizers through the WhatsApp link. Thank okay, you so much. I, I just have a doubt. Uh, uh, yes, is the feedback form and the attendance form one and the same, or are they two forms? Because it says no, 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 slash. No. I'm sorry, it is the same. It is the same. So uh, same. the feedback oh. form and the attendance is the same. It is the same link. It, okay. uh, it serves a dual purpose, your feedback and the attendance as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, I will. Uh, I'm posting the link again. Kindly make note. अच्छा आ रहा था सरिता अग्रवाल स्पीकिंग करते
Dear participants, the link has been posted in the chat box. Kindly make note. Uh, within half five minutes, we'll be ending the meeting. You cannot access the link again.